So Justice Christine Durham has been on the Utah Supreme Court since 1982 and served as Chief Justice and Chair of the Utah Judicial Council from 2002 to 2012. That's a big deal here in Utah. She previously served on the state trial court for many years and, in, uh, and then private practice before that. She received a, a degree uh, from Wesley College and a JD from Duke University. Um, she is past president of the Conference of Chief Justices of the United States and also past chair of the American Bar Association's Council on Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar, the entity that accredits uh, the American law schools. Um, she's been involved with the Council of American Law Institute, the Board of Overseers for the Rand Corporation's Institute for Civil Justice, and is a fellow of the American Bar Foundation. I just took a few things. So those are just a few things. Um, I didn't want to take most of her time introducing her, so I won't go into all those, but, but I would encourage you to read her bio. Uh, she has, has much other, many other professional service roles and has been active in judicial education and was the founder of the Leadership Institute in Judicial Education. And actually here in Utah, she created the Utah Coalition for Civic Character and Service education and has served on the Utah Commission for Civic Education. So she has many um, honorary degrees, five, five from different Utah institutions and has, men, has received many wonderful awards as well. So welcome, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation to be part of this fabulous event, and congratulations to all of you for showing up and participating. It makes a difference. I've been asked to say a few words about leadership. I was just briefly listening to, to uh, the introduction when education was mentioned. This, this is a prime example of the ways in which leadership opportunities come along. One of the stories about me is that when I first became a trial judge, I was a relatively young lawyer. I went on the bench fairly young, and although I had experience trying cases in the courtroom and opportunities um, you know, to practice law and do what lawyers do, they handed me a borrowed black robe and a case file, assigned me a courtroom and a court clerk, and said, go be a judge, <laughs> literally. And, you know, I muddled my way through. I eventually learned how to do my job. But I left that experience thinking, this is a heck of a way to run a railroad. <laughs> and that's what launched my interest in professional education for members of the judiciary, both on the judicial side and on the staff side. And that led, that led me to find multiple opportunities down the road to get active in organizing professional education for judges so that they could improve their skills, keep up with the law, learn, learn about things like gender bias in the courtroom. Uh, so th that's just one example of something I want to talk about tonight having to do with leadership. Leadership has so many components. There's a whole program here at UVU which talks about uh, the development of leadership and what it is. To me, it has at least two very significant components. Uh, the first is care, and the other is challenge. In order to be an effective leader, you've got to care about the people and the institutions that you are engaged with. You have to consider yourself in some way responsible for helping other people to do what they do better. And you also have to be willing to challenge them to do it better. And that doesn't, that doesn't re neither of those phenomena, neither the caring nor the challenging, requires you to have a fancy title, a big deal job, uh, people bowing and scraping when you come in the room. It simply means that you have to be aware of opportunities to care for other people in a way that helps them live better lives and to challenge them to do that. So I wanted to mention tonight, my time is a little short, 
So I, I wanted to keep it as short and sweet as I could. I want to share with you four things that I've learned about leadership in a very long career. Uh, I graduated from law school. I was counting up while you were introducing me for nearly 47 years ago. That's really a long time. And by the way, when I graduated, um, out of every 100 lawyers in the United States, do you want to guess how many of them were female in 1971? Two. Two. So, <laughs> so with respect, I assume that's applause for surviving. Thank you. I'll take that. So what that, what that means is that, particularly with respect to women's participation in the profession and what women could bring to the law in every dimension has been part and parcel of what I've been engaged in for nearly half a century. And it has been a great privilege. It's wonderful to see the progress that we've made, the changes in the law that have, occur, have occurred, the changes in the profession, the changes in the courts. That doesn't mean there aren't multiple opportunities in my profession and in every other endeavor in the community, in education, in business, in government for, for work. There's lots of work. So I wanted to share four things that I have learned. Uh, the first is, and I think this is unfortunately particularly a message for women and for young women, never underestimate yourself. Never sell yourself short. Uh, let me just quote uh, one of my favorite heroines, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Has anybody made you feel inferior in the last 24 hours, week, month? I mean, I recall as a young woman how insecure and uncertain I was about my abilities, about my talents. Uh, and sometimes you get encouragement and sometimes you don't. And when you don't particularly, it can be very difficult not to underestimate yourself. One of the things we know from the social science research about women is that they tend to be more diffident about their abilities than men do. Don't ask me why, but it took me a long time to figure out that, you know, I, for example, I wor I've worked in uh, judicial appointments all the years. You would be astonished at some of the young male lawyers who think they're ready to be judges. And you would likewise be astonished at some of the young female lawyers who don't think they're ready to be judges, even though the, the objective uh, relationship between the two might tell quite another story. So along with Eleanor Roosevelt, don't ever give anybody permission to make you feel inferior. Number two, it's very important, and just showing up for this event and participating in these workshops is an essential part of leadership. And that is looking for company, looking for connections and for support, particularly from other girls and women. I would never have been able to accomplish the things that I've been able to do in my career without locating other, other like-minded women. And over a lifetime, they've become my dearest friends. Uh, one of the th things I'm most thrilled about is the chance after moving to Utah in the mid-70s, I had, uh, I like to tell a story, I attended a conference up at the University of Utah College of Law, and uh, I met a lawyer from Utah, we were just barely here, and she invited me to a cocktail party after the conference, and I went to the home of, of a more senior woman lawyer, someone who'd gone to law school in the 50s, and there were 12 women lawyers there. And I'd just come from a couple of years in North Carolina where women lawyers were very scarce on the ground. I thought, my goodness, a dozen women lawyers. Utah's fantastic. This is going to be wonderful. I found out later, that was it. <laughs> that was it. But the connections we made and the friendships we made ultimately uh, led us to, to create 
an organization called the Women Lawyers of Utah, which to this day is still fighting for gender fairness issues and providing leadership in the community on all kinds, particularly of diversity and inclusion and inclusion initiatives. So making friends, reaching out, find people, people who think the way you do, maybe people who don't think the way you do, but who care about the same issues. Uh, so that's very important. Look around and keep trying. Number three on my list is, my alarm just went off, we'll see if it lets me know when my time's up. Uh, number three is just do it. You know, it's, um, it's, it, it's easy to look at issues like the ones that are on the March agenda, poverty and homelessness. What on earth can I, as, an, as a single individual, as a young woman, as a more mature woman, what can I do about homelessness and poverty? And then you look at someone like um, Pamela Atkinson. Anybody ever heard of Pamela Atkinson? Yeah. yeah, Pamela came from a very, I actually, I actually take some credit for Pamela Atkinson because I wrote a decision in the early 80s that told Intermountain Healthcare that they weren't entitled to tax exemptions for being charitable if they didn't actually provide some gift to the community. It was actually a tax case. But after they lost that case, they hired Pamela Atkinson. And Pamela, Pamela came to this community, brought skills that she had, not necessarily with homelessness or poverty, but she learned what she needed to know. She befriended the people she needed to befriend. And she became uh, not only a powerhouse in her own right, but a symbol of what a single individual could generate by way of inspiration and support, and she does so to this day. So one person can make a huge difference. Now, Pamela had a title that helped, and she had an institution behind her that helped, but she had already, already developed the skills that made them think she could do it. So look around for what needs doing. If you are experiencing something that you read about in the paper, that you experience in your own life, that friends are talking about, Think about ways that you might find to offer care and support and to offer challenge to other people that would improve that problem. The last thing I want to mention, so never underestimate yourself. Look for company. Just do it. Find the first step and take it. Is uh, the issue, I mentioned that uh, leadership is often about change. Now, when you are asking people to change, doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter where they work or what they do in their lives, when you're asking most people to change, well, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about it when you, you encounter someone or something that suggests to you that you've got to make some big changes in your life? Are you happy about it? <laughs> As human beings, most of us are not happy about it. We're happy with status quo. We like comfort. Uh, being comfortable in our lives is where most of us would prefer to stay. But if we stay there, and if the people around us stay there, nothing ever gets better. Nothing ever progresses. But when you, as a potential leader, ex or just a person exercising leadership, when you ask people to change, you have to be aware that there's going to be discomfort, there's going to be pushback. Uh, and that's why this element of care becomes so important. You really have to care about the people that you want to make changes. If you just want to run over them, mow them down, and believe me, I've been there. There have been stages in my life when I just wanted to mow them down <laughs> and say, you're wrong, all right, I'm right. This is how the world should be, and just do it. Uh, I didn't have a lot of uh, success with that approach, generally speaking. So what I want to say finally about leadership is that it is about change, that it does require care, but good leadership is often exactly the same thing as good followership. In the sense of what I said earlier about you don't need a title, you don't need to be the elected official, you don't need to be the person that everybody attaches the label of leader 
to. You need to be someone who's willing to challenge, to care, and to support. There's a, a saying going around that you've probably seen in, in campaigns associated with bullying and um, other kinds of unfairness. If you see something, say something. Well, I, I'd like you to expand the notion that that slogan uh, incorporates and think about ways, um, a, another version of that slogan. Uh, if you see something that needs getting better, if you need something that calls out for positive change, say something as a way of starting, but then do something about it. So that's why I started off with my story about judicial education. That affected me personally. I, <clears throat> I felt very much hung out to dry as a young professional, uh, and I didn't want other new judges and even older judges to have that experience. I thought that the courts as institutions would be better, fairer places if we did something more to support judges in their professional activities and to support the staff people who work for the courts in their professional activities. And that's what drove me to work on judicial education and judicial branch education. <laughs> Likewise, when I became a judge, I started to care a great deal about all of the issues associated with the courts, the delay that hurts people's lives, uh, the lack of education that a lot of judges have about the cases that they are dealing with. And so I saw education as a way to make inroads in the direction of positive change. Uh, so let's, so just, you know, think about, just think about what's happened to you in the last week. What you've experienced, what you've seen, what you've read about, what's awakened you in the middle of the night, and think about ways in which you, without any title, without any election, might do something about it. Might, at the very least, offer, you know, suicide prevention was on that list. I'm sure you're aware that just having people pay attention to other people and notice the signs of depression and serious mental illness, it can be the first step in the prevention of suicide. So there are better, if, you, if you've noticed better ways to do something uh, to make positive change in groups or organizations, if you see something, say something, and then do something. Let me close with another uh, quotation that I love from Eleanor Roosevelt, which means a great deal to me, and I, and I hope it'll carry over into your group discussions. A mature person, something we all aspire to become, right? Who does not, is, I'm sorry, a mature person is one who does not think only in absolutes, who is able to be objective even when deeply stirred emotionally, who has learned that there is both good and bad in all people and in all things, and who walks humbly and deals charitably with the circumstances of life, knowing that in this world no one is all-knowing and therefore all of us, and I love this line, all of us need both love and charity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. Good advice for all of us.